Recorded live at Tox and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Tox and Tasting Studios, it is the Clerical Errors Podcast. I'm Bull Hagen. And I'm Brig. And I'm Vicar. Welcome to the show. So we are bunkered in. Or we are. We are uh, in a, a secure room, right? Like we always are. No NBA players has touched our microphones. That's true. Not yet. <laughs> and uh, we're ready to go. Uh, our topic today is going to be prayer, and then we're going to end with a, a topic about uh, a little bit about the resurrection. And so, so it should be interesting. But uh, hey, Vicar, why might be pr- why might prayer be in a lot of people's minds right now? Well, I think there's a lot of fear and anxiety going on with this. Uh... COVID-19, and also just like the global recession that the world's going through right now. Uh, And when a Christian feels fearful or anxious about the things of this world, our Lord tells us to to go to him in prayer and to to hear his comforting words also in church. So I think it's a good topic for today. A good topic. Yeah. So, uh, Let's uh, begin with our beverage here, Vicar. Yeah, so Vicar brought the brought the beverage today. That's right. Uh, we are recording in the the AM, which is a little unusual. So, I decided to go for a uh, a breakfast themed drink. I brought uh, coffee today, but it's not just any type of coffee. This is maple bacon coffee. That's right, listener. You heard that right. Maple bacon coffee. So, is it maple and bacon flavored, or do they actually have bacon in the coffee. Unfortunately, the only ingredients are coffee, natural, and artificial flavors. So, you know, on a Vicar mm-hmm. budget, mm-hmm. good. you find the $2.50 <laughs> um, 12-ounce package of coffee grounds, and you could just go for it. So this unique light roast blends all your favorite breakfast flavors into one indulgent cup of coffee. Infused with the irresistible smokiness of bacon... The flavor is rounded out by a deliciously sweet finish of maple and caramelized sugar. All right. You know, I always think of uh, the TV show Better Off Ted when I think of stuff like this, like that this was all like crafted in some lab somewhere. And <laughs> you, you have these scientists who are just like, you know, trying to get all the molecules right, to, you know. <laughs> or, or, or maybe they, they were roasting coffee and they burnt it or something. And someone said, it kind of tastes like bacon. All right. Premium coffee. <laughs> well, we ruined this batch. How can we save it? <laughs> Call it bacon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we mustn't. We mustn't spread conspiracy theories. There are plenty to go around right now. So uh, I'll take a sip here. I know what it tastes like. It's not bad. I I get the maple. I don't get the the smokiness. I don't get the bacon. I get a little bit of a smokiness. But you know what it kind of reminds me of? Okay. Do you ever one of those like real like you go to uh Bob Evans? Yeah, it's kinda of in the back of your throat, the smoky, yeah. Right. It, it it's uh affecting the coronavirus. <laughs> 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 not no, we're not joking about that. Okay, that's, that's no yeah, jokes. That's... Okay. Um, actually, I must say, I must say, I around the house every once in a while, I do kind of have a dark sense of humor, and does that shock either of you? Um, by the way, Peter isn't here. Uh, he is uh, asleep because uh, he worked last night, got off this morning, and he is sound asleep. So. But, but uh, you know, I kind of joke with my wife when I make a kind of a darker joke. I said, well, I can joke about this because, because I deal with this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so what this t- tastes like is if you go to Bob Evans and you, you get like you stuff yourself with those giant pancakes. Okay, yeah. And then or you have a buffet that has unlimited bacon, right? And you just stuff yourself and then you use coffee to wash it down. <laughs> And then you're in the car on the way home, and you have, like, a little bit of a wet burp. Okay. Yep. <laughs> That's it. 
That is a fantastic image. <laughs> Listeners, take it to heart. No, now, uh, gentlemen, close your eyes. Imagine you just had a burp in your car. See if it works out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So yeah, if if you enjoy that, I I would recommend this. I've been known to do that once in a while. Is that <laughs> like uh, have a a burp and like yeah, that was a good meal. You know. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, uh, Berg, uh, what are you preaching on? Oh, what's the text for? Uh, this the text Sunday? is Luke eleven, uh, Jesus and Beelzebub. Yeah. So start us off, Vicar. Give us a quick summary. So, yeah, sure. So um, Jesus uh, casts out a demon um, from a mute man. The mute man speaks once the demon has been thrown out of him. And he is accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons. And others tried to test him, uh, seeking from him a sign. Uh, but then Jesus kind of goes on on the defense and even the offense here in defending his work. He says that every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a divided household fail, falls. If Satan's divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, um, but, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges." But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And then Jesus has the familiar um, strong man uh, parable here with where he teaches that a strong man guards his own palace, his goods are safe, but when a stronger one comes and attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away the strong man's armor, which he trusted, and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me, Jesus says, is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So this uh, text is uh, a wonderful text because what I like about it is there's about like 12, I should do a, I could have done a top 12 like sermon themes you could bring out of yeah, this text. I was thinking there's the a same lot here. thing. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So first of all, when we talk about uh, Beelzebul, what are we talking about, Berg? Well, um, yeah, well, I think we should even start even before that, okay. um, you know, uh, demons, they're real. Yes, right? absolutely. Demons are real. Um, they possess people and they cause not only spiritual harm, but they also cause physical harm as we see in this text today, right? But by the way, I would, would say that this is something uh, behind the collar moment. Something that, as pastors, we never have to convince our uh, confirmation age age kids, sixth, seventh, eighth graders. We never have to convince them about the reality of demons. Did you ever right. notice that? Yeah. No, they. Well, and some of the stories you hear from people. Um, it, I mean, it's uh, it's. You know, if if we didn't trust that Christ had already defeated the devil, I mean, they would be they would be terrifying. You know. Right. Um. Uh, you know, this is what I, as a kid, I always thought Scooby Doo was uh, not all that great because it was always a man in a mask, and I was like, you know, I mean, honestly, <laughs> yeah. right? But that sort of, um, I think that sort of shallow rationalism is going away. I think you know, um, it's being replaced by superstition, right? Like ghost hunters and all that kind of nonsense. But um, people actually do believe more in the spirit in the supernatural now than I think they did even supernatural but not religious exactly yeah oh i mean it is religious it's just they're it's not christian yeah it's a false religion right Right. um which is why we should call it what it is superstition you know right um so i think that's the first point is that you know demons are real demons are not human souls who go to hell they are fallen angels right uh who followed satan in his rebellion against god um, and they seek to harm us. And, like, the world is teaching us the exact opposite. There are shows on TV like Lucifer, for example, which make the devil into a good guy. Mm-hmm. He goes around and solves murder mysteries. And and, and, I, and I would say this, too. You know, as a pastor, 
um, someone asked me recently, um, how often have you performed an exorcism? Or we talked about our last pastor's meeting, didn't we? Mm -hmm. How many of you have actually had someone in your care that you were kind of sure that they had struggling with a demon of some sort? And we couldn't think of necessarily personal examples if you think of the fantastical things that you might see in a movie. Because I think, you know, the devil and the demons work in ways that are more subtle that, yeah. that catch you unawares. I mean, you look at the Old Testament, you don't see very many demons on the that are there overtly. Right. right? You, you see demonic powers working through evil leaders. Yeah. Well, like look at Saul. Right. Saul, as soon as he rejects God's word, it says he is tormented by an evil spirit. And the guy acts insane. Yeah. You know? Um, and I think that should actually teach us, like, not every physical or mental malady is um, is can be reduced to a chemical imbalance in the brain. Right. Or something like that. Sometimes um, these things happen uh, because of supernatural agencies. Mm -hmm. um, now, don't misunderstand me. Like, you actually have to do some real work to investigate that, and pastors mm -hmm. do that. Um, Particularly with things like, um, uh, things like paranoid schizophrenia, where people are hearing voices, and to differentiate that, you know, um, and, uh, but you know, people look down on this and say, oh, well, they're just crazy or they're just crooks like Joseph Smith and, uh, Muhammad. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I believe an angel did appear to both those guys. It was just of the fallen variety. Right. Wait, which one reason why those religions might grow so fast? Because they were very sincere. They truly right, believed you know? it. And, and, and I think too is, is you can just look at historical things in modern history and and people try to explain these things just by you know social behavior or 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 psychology but but you look at what happened for example in the holocaust in world war ii i mean how can you say that wasn't demonic the way they were systematically killing people well and even just hitler's um I mean, they called it the devil's luck. I mean, they attempted to assassinate him multiple times, and um, you know, he yeah. was he was preserved. Um, so, and so, it's, or you look at uh, nine eleven, right? You know, people flying planes into buildings, or you you look at uh, uh, abortion, the way people are so fanatically, not only saying abortion is a choice, but now celebrating their abortions, you right. know? Isn't it in uh, Minneapolis or St. Paul, one of those, where they're, there's like a like a hero thing where they're like uh, remembering the, like, and honoring uh, those who performed abortion, yeah. you it's... know? T so tell me, tell me, you okay, people want to deny the existence of demons. I mean, when it goes that far, what else? could be driving that. Jesus said, whoever is for me is against me. Mm -hmm. And I think I think nowadays it's working through many means. It has many openings, many addictions that open the door, many things online that hurt and damage souls that that uh, um, cause them to, to to lead them into darkness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and 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 so they're real, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, again, getting back to your original question, you asked about Beelzebul. Beelzebul is um, actually named, I think it's in First Kings, um, where uh, one king wants to go to the god of Ekron, and his name is Baal Zul. Um, he's the god of Ekron. He's a, and Ekron is a Philistine city. This also shows that um, demons are a masquerade as false gods, mm -hmm. right? Um, we see this also in uh, Pastor Doug Judish's um, uh, appointed Old Testament reading from Deuteronomy, right? That the children of Israel, when they grew fat and hardened their hearts, uh, sacrificed to demons and not to God, right? To mm -hmm. these false gods. Um, that every false religion has a demon behind it. 
you know? I think sometimes we, we fall into that, well, they just hallucinated or they just did this. I mean, no. Why, you know, why can't demons masquerade as, as gods? Yeah. It makes sense, you know? Especially since they are so very powerful and intelligent. And that really helps you understand a lot of the Old Testament. Old Testament, um, because Greek mythology, Norse right. mythology. Because in the Old Testament, you know, not only was it a battle between people, it was a battle between gods. You know, god and the devil, right? You right. Know, the true god and these these false gods. We right? see it with uh, Pharaoh's magicians when Moses goes and performs those first uh, signs. Right. With the snakes and the and the blood. And that there is there is power. The the devil does he is the prince of, of the darkness. And and this is where that movie, um Prince of Egypt, it's the cartoon, uh, where they make it look like it's char you know, a mummery and right. uh uh like they're charlatans. They use like smoke bombs and stuff. Right. To, and to, uh <laughs> and like red red dirt to make right. the water, you know, and it's like, no, that's not how it happened. I mean false prophets can do false and dark miracles. Yeah. This is how it was back then, and that's how it's going to be in the ages to come, right? Where uh, in Revelation, the beast of the earth does does miracles, mm -hmm. which misleads people. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why uh, we shouldn't be too quick to say, well, you know, these guys, these televangelists who do miracles, um, that they are um, charlatans. Maybe not. Maybe there's something else going on Something there. darker, yeah. Right. And... Uh, with that in mind, I think it's good to point out in this that Jesus actually did drive out the demon. Right. He drove out the demon. And then he said, you know, when the stronger man comes, then you know, and the finger of God drives out this demon, then you know the kingdom of God is here. Right. And that's a great parable to teach that, you know, um, see, people fall into one of two camps. They either ignore the devil, pretend like he doesn't exist, or they get really unhealthily obsessed about it. Right. And Christians um, don't do that because uh, we have hope, right? That the, de that the devil has been defeated. He has been tied up. The, the armor in which he trusted, that is the law of God, has been stripped from him so that way he can no longer accuse us before the Father in heaven. Um, that this victory has already been won. And... This should, and we have the word of God, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which makes us blessed and keeps us safe. Um, this, and he also, Jesus talks about in that, that not only does he drive out the demons, you know, it's, it's, it's something has to fill that spot. <laughs> right, right. You know, and so as he drives out the demon, he says that they're not going to rest until they find a home. And then if you don't have Christ in there, What's going to happen? You're just going to replace the demon with something stronger. Right. Seven other devils, right? Um, and that's the thing, too. Huh. There's just so much you could talk about here because you could talk about, you know, this myth of haunted houses. You could talk about um, the sin against the Holy Spirit. You could talk about... Um, you could talk about how, how how there is hope in the midst of your own sin and temptation mm -hmm. that the, the stronger one... Yeah, you could Conquer even talk. Those ab things. You could even talk about uh, because at the end of this text, you have um, really the first instance of Mary of of Mary uh, adoration, right? Right. Blessed is the uh, the one. Yeah, the paps which gave you suck, right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus, uh, you know, he gently corrects her on that, right? Mm -hmm. More than that, blessed is he who hears the word of God and keeps it, mm -hmm. right? And so there is just there's there's so many wonderful applications here that change the way that we believe, right, that the world is teaching us to believe, that change uh, our lives, right, mm -hmm. that we should not, um, um, that, you know, we, uh, we, are not, uh, we are not strong without Christ, right? It's amazing that in this uh, whole thing, what are the human beings in this? They're not actors, no. right? They're the possessions in the strong man's house, <laughs> or they're the house, right? Right. I mean, they don't actually. We don't actually do anything, right? right? We're like we're like the football being <laughs> passed back and forth, right? And this is offensive to most Americans because we've been taught about you know freedom and uh, um, self determination and all this, and um, 
and 12-step programs to do it. Right. Yeah, we're, and we're also the ones who hear, and that's completely passive. I mean, right. You can't help but hear. I mean, unless you put uh, noise-canceling headphones on, but that's... Which are pretty cool. Yeah, which are pretty cool. But uh, anyway, yeah, that's good. We want to move on? So, uh, yeah, I think... Uh, yeah. I think uh, while we, I think it's just important that when we think of this discussion, we don't just end it that demons are powerful. Yeah, yeah. But that Christ is is more powerful. Yeah, well, and that's the thing when you have a text like this is, it's a gold mine. I mean, you can, right. you know, I mean, there's so much here that you can talk about. There's so much, there's so much to learn. There's warning here. There's uh, reproof, but there's also lots of comfort. So and 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 why don't we? I think it might be nice to, to, to end with this discussion. And that is if you're worried about it, you know, and there might be a listener who might be worried that maybe they're being tormented or hmm. they, they hear things in the house or something mm-hmm. like that. Okay. Pray the Lord's prayer, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Well, and, and r- go read God's word, right? Go to your pastor. First of all, right? Yes. That's what you need. If you don't have a pastor, Go to the LCMS locator and find one. And then... LCMS.org. Yes, LCMS.org. It's at the top right hand corner, right? Find a pastor because, you know, first of all, you shouldn't be doing any of this stuff by yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay? That is a bad idea. That's like uh, that's like the injured wildebeest trying to take on the lion. <laughs> right. It doesn't work, right? Um, find a pastor. Find other Christian brothers and sisters. And like Pastor Boygan said, uh, read God's word, pray, um, take the sacraments, um, you know, do the things, you know, receive the things that God gives you. Because think about it. If the stronger man, it comes, is there a better image of the stronger man and a better way the stronger man can come by his own body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins? Mm. Right. Is there anything more offensive to that? That weaker spirit mm-hmm. than Christ in His body and blood feeding you. And if you are being tormented by these things, you'd also need other people to examine you to make sure that this actually is something supernatural and not just you know, so yeah. you know. And that's the thing is that uh, your pastor is not your therapist, right? You know, we uh, give the most. We give the one thing needful, mm. right? We give the one thing that forgives sins, but we are not psychologists either. So um, your pastor can also point you to good and godly uh, psychologists who can maybe help you through some of this stuff too if you if you need that sort of help. Yeah. All right. So as we get into the topic of prayer here, and we we've brought about two things here, right? We've talked about a prayer. We've talked about obviously our text, and we've also talked a little bit about uh, the coronavirus. Right? right. So I thought I would, and maybe this could bring a little discussion itself. Um, um, there's a prayer, and this was brought to my attention on a Facebook post by a, a fellow brothers of ours, uh, Pastor David Mummy, who uh, posted a, a prayer that is from a prayer book called the Lutheran Prayer Companion. Do you have one of those? Yeah. Uh, yes, I have. I have lots of things. You have, so. you have, yeah. You have a lot of books, Berg. So there, it's somewhere. Do you have one, Vicar? I do. So uh, this is a uh, a prayer from that book, and I thought I would just read it because it has a lot of the in its, within the prayer itself. There's a lot of interesting things to think about and consider in this prayer. So I will go ahead and read this prayer, and I want to thank. Uh, Pastor Mummy, uh, from pointing these things out. So, Almighty, everlasting God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord of heaven and earth, we poor miserable sinners must confess that we have most dreadfully angered you, O God, with our sinful life and being. Wherefore, you justly pour out your wrath upon us and attack us with various plagues, epidemics, and diseases. What then should we do? Should we despair? Far be it. We know that we deserve not only the epidemic which now rages as punishment for our manifold sins, but even greater and more heinous plagues than this. Where then shall we flee? 
and where shall we turn, that we may be safe from this and other plagues and pandemics? To you, to you alone, Lord Jesus Christ, we have no other comfort either in heaven or on earth except you, who have redeemed us. Surely you will not cast off your creation. Therefore we humbly call, sigh, and cry out to you with our whole heart, saying, God, be merciful unto us, and blot out all our sins according to your exceeding great grace, goodness, and mercy. Cease from your displeasure, wrath, and indignation toward us. Show us again your grace, and spare us from the epidemic and abominable sickness which now rages. Listen to our pleas, O Lord. Listen to our pleas and spare us. Kindly protect and shelter us, that this epidemic may not may not hurt or come near us, nor seize or take us away. But if you, if it be your divine will that we should, in, should end our life in this epidemic and depart this world, your divine grace and fatherly hand, humbly beseeching from our heart that if we should meet our final hour unexpectedly, even now approach the time when our body and soul must separate, you would mercifully preserve our faculty of reason that we may be able to, with a clear mind, to commend our souls to you, and grant us further a blessed end, that we, passing through temporal death, which is the end of all sorrow and misery, and opens to us the door of eternal life, may the more speedily enter into that same eternal life, and come to our Redeemer and Savior, with all the elect of God in heaven, eternally rejoice. Amen. Indeed. How often do people think of, of an epidemic and say, actually, we deserve worse? Not very many people, unfortunately. Um, and I think, too, like this teaches such wonderful things. First, that um, God actually does send plagues. He does actually send these things upon us as punishments. Um, most people don't want to believe that. Um, in fact, uh, I've had it where parishioners have, you know, when I say things like this, that God sends crosses, uh, they actually they get really nervous as if, uh, you know, well, the devil does that, but God, you know, he's he can wash his hands. You know, he just permits it, right? Yeah. Um, well, I, I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to say, well, God doesn't create evil, Right. And that's a good thing to say. God doesn't right. God doesn't create evil. But God does punish sin. And it's not just in the life to come, but it's also here in this world. And that that guys is so important. Just like you, you know, punish and chastise your children. Why do you do it? Because you love them, right? You care about them. You want them to repent and be saved. And this happens all the time in the Old Testament. This happens in the New Testament, right? And he does this because he loves us. The Lord disciplines the ones whom he loves. Um, so, and it doesn't mean that God is angry with you. I mean, the worst thing is if God wouldn't punish us at all. Right. And so, I, I don't know, it's, uh, rather than viewing these things with hysteria, um, we should like you said, acknowledge Christ's, uh, you know, uh, God's displeasure over our sin, right? Um, which happens not just in this life with sickness, but also in eternity with eternal damnation. And, and, then, and then also remember what Christ has done, that he has done, that he has suffered all things for us. Right. Uh, that he has taken on even the coronavirus, right? When it says that he, surely he bore our sicknesses, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, he's born even this for us. I guess one reason why this whole thing is on our minds too is as pastors, there's uncertainty. We, you know, what's going to happen in the next weeks? Are people going to try ask us to close our doors? What will we think about visiting our elderly because we want to see them and give them the comfort at the same time? We want to keep them safe. Well, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, they've kind of quarantined all of the assisted livings and uh, and the uh, nursing homes here. Yeah, so you know, so you know, as pastors, we are less concerned about our own health and more concerned about the others. If right. we get it, 
we get it, but we don't want to give it to anybody else is the right. thing, you know. Um, and, and so to take, you know, proper pre- precautions, but also remember that it is God. And even if you do die of the coronavirus, as a Christian, that is, that's not the worst thing in the world, mm-hmm. right? Because Christ has already transformed death. He's taken away the sting of death and that you get to join the elect in heaven mm. where our Lord Jesus reigns, where there is no sadness or sickness anymore. I mean, I don't know. I, for a Christian, this is a win-win situation. I mean, you know. Right. Now, that, that's actually the kind of words I've actually used sometimes when people are in a hospital and they're facing it in a certain time. I say it's, it's a win-win in the sense of if, if God heals you and you, you recover from this, what a blessing. If if God calls you home, what a blessing. Yep, an even greater blessing. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. It's like we're not trying to minimize the pain because we know the pain is real. We've seen it. We've seen it more than 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 you, you know? we. I mean, we do, right? Mm-hmm. We walk into hospitals and we see pain all the time, you right. know? Um, but we have to put it in perspective, that this is a light, momentary affliction, and that a weight of eternal glory awaits us. Kind of like we don't minimize the pain of the cross, right? Right. And the suffering of the cross. We don't minimize that, but at the same time, we don't make Lent and Good Friday all about the pain. Right. You know? It's not a, it's six, not a, it's not a six week, you know, wallowing a funeral, around. You know, funeral service for Jesus. <laughs> right. I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, Vicar, what are you thinking about right now? Well, I, I've been thinking about that prayer, and I liked a uh, particular phrase in there, praying for a clear mind. I think, uh, as Pastor Berg mentioned, the hysteria. We've all seen the hysteria, whether it's people uh, spending money in a certain way or— uh, Or buying up all the toilet paper. Yeah. Come on, right. guys. I right. mean, <laughs> if you if you have to go to the bathroom that much— <laughs> like you got bigger things to worry about than this virus. <laughs> hey, you can't even buy it on Amazon. That's crazy. It's yeah, but uh, that that prayer for a clear mind in the midst of a world of hysteria. Because honestly, I mean, I'm I'm 25, and I I remember H1N1, and uh, but it to me it w- did not reach the level of hysteria that this has. Um, well, I mean, they say it's more deadly than the flu. Yeah, for certain age groups. Yeah. So. Yeah. But um, yeah, just uh, you know, the like a a large sporting organization suspended their season last night with the NBA. March Madness for the first time in my life will not have fans, which is going to be an odd experience if they even play the games. In fact, I just received notification, breaking news. Dun, 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 uh, dun. Big Ten, SEC, and American cancel conference tournaments. Wow! So they're not even going to play, which makes sense because you got a bunch. Of, you got ten guys on the floor, like physically, like touching each other all the time. Well, and just all <laughs> the fans. I mean, that's the thing. Is yeah. like when you pack those stadiums with what sixty thousand, eighty thousand yeah. people. You know, and let's just face it, people today are terrible at hygiene. <laughs> Right, it's true. You know, and they need to like wash their hands and stuff. Right. Like, I mean, I've never like it's like especially in a restaurant, and you have to wait for the employee to come and wash your hands because of the sign. Oh, yes, yes, I, yeah. that is a good joke, by the way. <laughs> Listener, if you didn't laugh, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, the sign it's, it's by law. It says employees must wash your hands. So, okay. so, but yeah, no, I mean, and that's the thing. Let's not freak out, but let's be calm and measured, and actually take steps to slow this down, right? Because that's the thing. We just don't want hospitals overflowing uh, and where people can't get, you know, good medical care. Right. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that's, those are the things, you know, so wash your hands. If you're sick, stay home. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I know uh, there's a pastor out in Kirkland, Washington, you know, he's like half a mile from, you know, kind of ground zero of this. They still have church. Right, they still have church. They've taken steps to um, minimize, you know, the spread of disease and stuff. But you know, right? Because um, we talked about maybe not shaking hands for a while. Right. You know. So it's, you know, be confident that Christ has 
defeated death, and that includes the coronavirus. Man, I'm bummed I can't watch Minnesota beat Iowa. Darn. Yeah, that, there, was a, there was their chance to get into the tournament, right? <sighs> <laughs> oh, well. All right. Well, that brings us to uh, our next segment. Usually it's done by me, me, but today it's done by the very reverend Pastor Berg. And that is our uh, what it is, what it ain't, and what it could be. Peter, play the intro. What is it? Who knows? We do. It's time for what it is, what it ain't, what it could be. All right. So since uh, we we kind of ended, uh, we had a good uh, segue in for prayer, right? Um, today we're going to talk about what is prayer. What it is. Prayer is a request or a petition, right? You're asking God and sometimes even people for stuff, right? So sometimes right. you'll hear that old phrase, I pray you, right? Or pray, tell me, right? right? So prayer is a request. You are asking for something, okay? And petitions, obviously we see this in the Lord's Prayer because we ask for stuff, right? Right. So and and there's some some importance just in the mere asking of it because in the mere asking of it you have to make the realization that these things come from not from yourself but you depend upon God for those things. Right. All right. So, what prayer isn't? What it ain't. Prayer is not the means of grace. The means of grace are the word and the sacraments. The means of grace is where God is doing stuff to us. In the word and in the sacraments, God is forgiving our sins. He is bringing life and salvation. God is the actor. We are not the actors. Prayer is different. Prayer is where we are doing something. We are asking God for things. Prayer is an exercise of our faith. Prayer is a good work. What it ain't. Prayer is not a spare tire, only to be used in cases of emergency. Prayer, because it is an exercise of faith, uh, should be on the lips of every Christian at all times. Paul tells us to pray unceasingly. We see it in our, in our Lord's own prayer life. Even though he was very, very busy, he took the time early in the morning to get away from the crowds and even from his own apostles to pray and commune with his Father who is in heaven. Prayer should be a vital part of the Christian's life. What it ain't. Prayer is not you putting enough nickels into the divine candy machine to get a candy bar. Hmm. Right? Prayer is not something that you can do to coerce God to do your will. And we see this with James and John, two very close apostles to Jesus, right. right? After Jesus tells them about his suffering and his death, they con their mother into going before Jesus and asking for something, which means they're praying, right? Mm -hmm. What does she pray? She asks for um, one of her sons to sit at his right hand and another son to sit at his left hand when he comes into his kingdom. They think they are asking for positions of power and authority that will put them above their other rivals, the apostle, the other apostles, right? Especially above Peter, right? Right. Because that's the thing, is that there are rivalries among the apostles. Yeah. Right? They're always arguing about who's the greatest. Right. Yeah. That actually happens in, like, church bodies, too, right? Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> But Jesus, as, as speaking as your circuit visitor, you know who likes his authority and puts his thumb over everybody. You know, I yes, you are a cruel taskmaster. <laughs> I know it better than anyone else. You do. <laughs> Experience makes the theologian vicar. That's right. So tentatio. Yes. So, but Jesus doesn't answer their prayer. Why? Because they don't know what they're asking for, and he's not going to give them something that harms them. Right? Mm -hmm. Because what does it mean to be on Jesus' right hand or on his left hand when he comes into his kingdom? Well, this could either be talking about the cross, mm -hmm. you know, or it could be talking about the sheep and the goats. Right. Where one is saved and one is damned. 
Jesus is not going to give us stuff that is going to harm us, either physically or spiritually, right? And so what does he do? He actually teaches them. Even though they should have gotten what his kingdom is, right? That it is right. a kingdom of the cross, that it is a spiritual kingdom, um, they still don't get it, right? That's, which kind of amazes me because they're following Jesus. It had to be confusing to them. I mean, they're following Jesus. They see him do all these things. He's got some, all these miracles and his teachings. And obviously, it they, they was very amazing to them, right? And so when they think of this kingdom, how, what impression did Jesus, did they, of Jesus, they think that he was kind of out there to really, like, be out there for his own glory and to, you know, bring his disciples to be these, these great. Yeah, I mean, and that was their conception of the Messiah, right? Right. That even after three years, they still didn't, even G Jesus is like, hey, we're going up to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And then I'm going to be raised from the dead. Right. Well, that's not how a Messiah is supposed to act. It's uh, So it must be a metaphor for something. It's especially apparent in the Gospel of Mark. That's what we're walking through in my Bible study, through the whole Gospel, verse by verse. And the disciples see, but they don't see. And in the Gospel of Mark, you have that two-stage miracle where Jesus heals the blind man, and he sees men walking like trees, and then he heals him again. The disciples are like the the middle of that, that first stage. They see Jesus, and at times they see him for who he is, but most of the time they don't understand. Right. Um, and so the second healing is, is when he's revealed on the cross and, and in his resurrected state. That's when they see fully. That miracle kind of shows us the disciples' understanding through the ministry of Jesus, right? And we're the same way, right? Right. Yeah. We uh, yeah. we don't we don't see Jesus the way that we should see Jesus all the time. Flesh still clings to us, right? You know, and many of the things we might ask for may not be good for us. Exactly. Right. That. Uh, well, and it's amazing because Jesus, in one sense, does answer their prayer, right? When he asks them, "Are you able to undergo this baptism that I'm going to go under you know, undergo?" and drink the cup that I drink. And they're like, oh yeah, we're able, right? I mean, it's like just the bluster and the and the swagger, right? Right. Um, but yet underneath all of that, they show that they love Jesus and they want to follow him, right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus actually grants their petition, right? James is the first apostle to die, right? And John suffers for many, many years as the only apostle mm -hmm. in exile at Patmos, mm -hmm. Right, so both of them do uh, undergo this baptism of blood, this baptism of suffering, and they do drink the cup of God's judgment. Um, but you know that's the thing is that Jesus isn't always going to answer. It's just like you guys and your kids. Your kids ask for scissors, right? When they're you know two years old, mm -hmm. right? You're not gonna give you know you're not gonna give them a pointy thing to like cut their face off. I mean you know. You don't do things that harm them. You give them things, you know. Well, it's like your kids. I bet your kids would have loved ice cream, eating ice cream every day. They probably asked for ice cream every day too mm -hmm. or whatever their favorite candy bar was or whatever, you know. Right. And, you know, then you give them vegetables. Actually, <laughs> actually, it's always more my wife than my children asking for ice cream. Here oh. we go. <laughs> so, oh. okay. Well, we should probably move on here. Uh, all right. What it could be. What it could be. Prayer could be a great comfort. We pray not just because God commands it in the second commandment, uh, but we also pray because he promises to hear us. Jesus gives us great promises concerning prayer, uh, that we and we should be comforted by it that there is an open ear in heaven, that God does listen to men. That God will close up the heavens for three and a half years because a man asks for it. God loves us and he has promised to hear us. What it could be. Prayer could be a vital part of your life. Um, prayer could be a wonderful thing um, to help you um, when you're sad, when you're happy. Uh, it could be something that you do time in and time out. Now, are you obviously... I might be stealing some thunder, so you can stop me. You want to continue first? No, go for it. Um, because you, when you pray um, the Word of God, right? Mm -hmm. 
you want to hear what God has to say in your prayer sometimes, right? Yep, that's exactly right. Diedrich Bonhoeffer said it the best, right? Why should we pray out of the poverty of our own heart when we can pray out of the riches of God's word, right? This brings us to what prayer could be for you. What it could be. Prayer could be found in the Bible, right? We have many prayers in the Bible. We have 150 of them in the Psalms. And not only that, but we also uh, can pray the Bible uh, very, very simply. And we might talk about that a little bit later, of how to pray the Bible. But if uh, that is too advanced for you, um, always pray the Lord's Prayer. Take each petition. Think about it. Uh, roll it around in your mind. And don't just start, because I think this is one thing that we always do. We always start with the fourth petition, with the needs of our bodies. Right. But we forget about the three petitions before that. The, the fa fact, the prayer that we just read about the the pandemic prayer, mm -hmm. that uh, that emphasized in the midst of torment of the body, the emphasis was on the care of the soul. Right. That I mean, there's a there's a unique um, connection between the two. Right. You know. Um, because, you know, if someone's in the hospital, what, they, who do they want to talk to? The, the pastor. pastor. Right. Yeah. And so that's the thing. It's like, start with the first petition. Hallowed be thy name. That God's name would be made holy among us by what we believe and by how we live. Right? Or, the, or even the our father. Right. That, that you have a father who, who, who loves you and cares for you and wants to do what is best for you. Right. Um, that God's kingdom would come through his word and that we might have preachers and teachers and that you as a, a congregation member can actually bring God's kingdom to other people by speaking his word. And when you speak that word, the Holy Spirit actually creates faith, not just for this life, but for the next one, right? Pray that God's will be done, that God would destroy the evil will of the devil and the world and your own flesh. Right? Because what is God's will? God's will is that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is what prayer could be. So. All right. Well, very good. Very good discussion. Okay, view viewers uh, or listeners, not viewers, because we can't see. Obviously, you can't see. Ah. <laughs> yes. Okay, listeners. Um, <laughs> the bull um, is strong in you. Yes, it is. <laughs> The uh, uh, next time um, I will do a campfire catechesis on praying the Bible, uh, how that uh, how what you read can then be reinforced in what you pray. Um, but now we are going on to Bullhagen's, right? Are we going to do Bullhagen's? Uh... Actually, I had an idea. Okay, Vicar, do you have any? Can we do like a short little book club? Yeah, I can do that. Awesome. So we're going over to Vicar's book club. Peter, play the intro. It's book time with Vicar. That's right. <laughs> so, Vicar, remind everyone what book you're you're going through in your book club. Yeah, so we're we're going through uh, "Has American Christianity Failed" by Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, uh, a pastor in Austin, Texas. And this last week, uh, we had a great discussion about the sacraments. In the Lutheran Church. Um, the title of the chapter of Wolf Mueller's, um, uh, his discussion on the sacraments is Go Play Outside. Uh, a lot of American Christianity wants to focus on the spiritual life in the internal. It's all, you know, inside of me. It, this is reflected in not only um, their preaching, but also the songs about how the Holy Spirit stirs me up on the inside and I need to this will turn into a enthusiastic worship where um, it's all about getting an internal response. And if I don't feel the internal response, well, then God must not be working inside of me. So Wolfmuller goes through uh, a baptism and Holy Communion and talking about the external uh, sacraments that Christ has given to the church with the promise of forgiveness attached to them. Mm -hmm. And it created a great discussion. Uh, I would say everyone in the book club knows somebody or more than one person or family members 
that have a different uh, view of holy baptism. We spent a lot of time uh, discussing what is often called a believer's baptism in American Christianity versus what the Bible says about baptism. And Wolf Mueller does a great job in his own telling his own story coming out of American evangelicalism, where he uh, he just said, and this is a great piece of advice, you know, if you have someone who is struggling with uh, our practice of baptism in that it saves and it's God's work and it imparts the forgiveness of sins, tell them to do a search online of the word baptism or baptize in the Bible. Eliminate all the passages that talk about John the Baptist, and you're going to find that every single passage that talks about baptism will either have the promise of the forgiveness of sins, the gospel, in the very verse that it is in, or in the verse preceding or the verse following, every single every single time. And that was, uh, uh, in Wolf Mueller's own experience, a very convincing point in his journey. Uh, we also talked about infant uh, baptism. Why do, why do we baptize babies? Uh, I don't know why. I had never thought about Acts 2, 38 and 39 that uh, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. You and your whole households. Yeah, and it's... This is for you and your The promise children, is for you and your children. And for those who are far off. And for those who are far right. off. I don't know why. Like, I always go to Matthew 28, babies are a part of all nations, but that's actually where he started, was Acts 2. Uh, and then we, t- we talked about the Lord's Supper, and, and honestly, in our community, um, we're hearing on the radio that churches are are ceasing having Holy Communion because of the coronavirus. And um, and Wolf Mueller in his chapter lays out, well, you're not going to find confessing Lutheran churches ceasing having the Lord's Supper because of what we believe regarding the Lord's Supper. Not only that it is the Lord's own body and blood, but that it is actually for us. It's for our forgiveness. It's for, for our eternal life and salvation. And so he went through... Uh, what's the primary purpose of uh, the Lord's Supper? It's the forgiveness of sins. It's not actually primarily church unity. Right. It's forgiveness of sins, um, which I find a, a compelling argument for the practice of closed communion. Um, but yeah, so we, we had a great discussion. And uh, next week, this coming week, we'll be looking at um, good works as well as... Um, Oh, gosh. I think we're going to talk about prayer, actually. Good. And how how actually sometimes prayer is a uh, time that we wrestle with God. And I think that was reflected in the prayer about the, the p- pandemic or the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. It's not an easy prayer to, to say, you know, hear us, O Lord. You know, we know your promises. Mm-hmm. We're calling you out on it. So we see that in the Psalms. Anyway, that's my update. And actually, that's th- that actually goes really well. And I probably I don't know if I talked about this a little bit in my, uh, um, what it is, what it you know ain't, what it could be. By the um, way, it, it brings a lot of joy <laughs> that I have forced you somehow through this podcast for you to say what it ain't all the time. <laughs> it's the way it goes. You know, I know internally it it's, must be it's, driving it's, you it's, crazy. It's painful. It's painful. <laughs> but. Um, this, the uh, I don't know if I ever got to the application of that prayer is not the means of grace. Um, if a Christian is sad or they don't feel like they're forgiven, don't tell them to pray more. Hmm. Do not tell them to pray more because rather than telling them to go play outside, right, to go to the objective words of Jesus, uh, you're telling them to dig deeper into themselves, to tell them to pray more is to tell them to do more, and that is not Christianity. Now, of course, especially they, especially if they're in the mind frame. Well, if I pray hard enough, I'll feel better about it. And if they don't feel better, then God isn't listening, right? Right. And so that's the thing: is that when someone is sad, when they don't feel like they're forgiven, when they uh, need to be reminded that they have a gracious God, we should direct them to their baptism. And say, you know, it doesn't matter what you feel, you're baptized, right? Yeah. Just like when you think mom and dad hate you, you're still part of the family, right? Right, right. Uh, same way with baptism, that you do have a gracious father. Same thing with the word, right? Jesus says it, and so it is true. Same thing with the Lord's Supper, right? Mm-hmm. You can't actually, like, ignore that forgiveness, right? 
you can ignore, you know, or, you know, Vicar has a son, you know, yeah. who uh, I'm sure fusses even during the service, yes, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. And sometimes, uh, I, you know. I think he's a little Pentecostal. I'm sorry, Vicar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to so. <laughs> discipline that out of him. But, but, but it, it kind of reminds me of, I hate to get back to the coronavirus mm-hmm. thing, but it's a good example. Right. Right? Is, uh, is, uh, you can't just go by how you feel necessarily, right? Because people, I, I'm guarantee you right now, there's like 12 million people who think they might have the coronavirus. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And they're going to run, run to the doctor. I have coronavirus. Now, if you have symptoms, certainly notify your doctor, right? Right. But my point is, is we might feel a certain way, but what's the truth? Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. You may not feel forgiven, but what's the truth? And that's why, you know, and Christians are really well-meaning in trying to help, right? Because that's what everybody wants to do. They want to help, yeah. right? Yeah. But telling them to pray more is not helpful. It just isn't, right? Um, and we Lutherans do this too. And uh, because we have forgotten how wonderful the sacraments are. We've forgotten how wonderful the objective word is. We fall into this too, and uh, and we need to reorient and say, no. When someone's sad, we remind them, yes, you are baptized. Mm-hmm. Yes, did you eat the Lord's supper? Well, then Jesus' body and He gave you a pledge, right? That His death was for you. Now there are times where Jesus, I think, explains that prayer can't change your heart in this way. You know, like when you have an enemy, what are you supposed to do? Yeah, you're supposed to pray, pray for, for them. them, right? But even that, that's a command, right? right. It's because there's something wrong with you. Right. <laughs> you know, and that's the thing. It's like you pray for them not because you want to a lot of times. <laughs> right. I mean, it's true, right? Mm-hmm. You know, but you pray for them because God commands you to, right? And in that word, that actually does change the way that you you feel about them. Well, hopefully. Right. And even, I mean, you know. You pray for some people just because, you know, it's uh, it's what God commands, right? That's a good way to kill your old flesh, right? Right. It's, it's hard for you to pray for someone's well-being and for an extended period of time and not over time actually care for them more. Right. But that isn't necessarily the prayer. No. That's the word of God. That's the word of God. You know, that is, you know, um, so, and that, but that's a good point too, is that, if you have an enemy, you should pray for them every day, uh, again and again and again. Hmm. So, and then if you, you know, don't, you know, and then you should read the words of Jesus on that, right? Or even just remember the Lord's Prayer, right? Mm-hmm. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, right? Even just using that verse and grounding your prayer in that um, will change your heart because that is God's word. Well, it sounds like we have a well-rounded show today. What do you think? Sounds good. There's no more maple bacon coffee left, so. (laughs) So, uh, on behalf of uh, those who are not here, Peter, who is probably snoring right now. Yep. And our associate producer, Hannah. (laughs) Want to see those show notes? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my. (sighs) And, uh... Uh, um, and I'm Bullhagen. And I'm Berg. <laughs> and I'm Vicker. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and may your may tests your, be negative. <laughs> may your toilet paper be stocked. <laughs> may your sanitizers be effective. Vicker, you got one? No. <laughs> you've, said, you've said it all, and more. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash podcast, on Twitter at clericalheirsp for podcast, or email us at feedback at clericalheirs.org. Thanks for listening to Clerical Heirs. See you next time.